All right, welcome everyone to day two, bright and early. Um, today, I have the pleasure to introduce Dr. Rand Waltzman, um, Deputy CTO of Rand Corporation and uh, Z-Term Pro Program Manager at DARPA. Uh, he'll be speaking on disinformation. Um, without further ado, can we give a large round of applause for our speaker? Uh, well, good morning, everybody. Um, so since this is, after all, DEF CON, people are interested in how to do things. I'm going to give this talk about disinformation, not from the point of view of how do you protect people from disinformation, only oh my, but how do you actually do disinformation? What, what makes quality disinformation? How can you really tell? And um, I also want to specifically emphasize the reason for the title of the talk saying that it's the thought that counts is that I want to try to make sure it's I mean, the, the purpose really is to get you in the right frame of mind for this kind of business. And the right frame of mind is not to get hung up too much on technical tricks. I mean, you've heard a lot about deep fakes and you have people talking about deep fakes and all this. Yeah, okay, that stuff is all fine and these are tools of the trade, but they are not the main point. And that's what I'm going to try to show you, explain to you today. So I want to start out with a quote. The man who never looks into a newspaper is better informed than he who reads them, inasmuch as he who knows nothing is nearer to truth than he whose mind is filled with falsehoods and errors. And how old do you think that quote is? Thomas Jefferson, 1807. So how much is really new? Well, that's pretty questionable, I think, at this point. Uh, actually, I don't know. How many of you heard this, the first speaker yesterday? Anybody? Yeah, so that guy, he, he made an interesting point. You know, he was trying to say, well, disinformation, these kind of techniques are not really new. They even go back as far as the 40s. Well, I got news for that guy. They go back way further than the 1940s. These kind of techniques go back a very, very long way, and they have a very long tradition. Uh, people talk about the Russians, for example. Uh, people talk about the KGB. You heard the term active measures. How many heard the term active measures? You know what that is? So people talk about that. Well... I can tell you that the, Soviet, that the KGB was using a playbook from the Okhrana. Anybody know what the Okhrana was? So the Okhrana was the predecessor of the KGB. That was the Tsarist secret police. The, Tsarist had, the Tsar had a very active, very effective uh, secret police and um, also involved in a lot of active measures and disinformation campaigns and other kinds of things. They were very active. In fact, I just wanted to start out by going, give you an example show you how far back this really goes, how effective things can be without technical tricks. And there was a case, um, there was a guy by the name of Rachkovsky, who was the head of the Okhrana office in Paris at the end of the 19th century, the very beginning of the 20th century. And he was, a, he was one of the great minds in the field of active measures. Really, really, one of the truly greats. And one of his schemes actually is still out there and active today over 100 years later. It's spectacular, so I want to talk about that a little bit, just to show you. Um, but before I, okay, so I had one, one side here, you know, sort of the bottom line up front is they say in the military, uh, basically things have gotten to the point where, you know, time is compressing to a point, space is just blown out completely, and you can get messages out anywhere in the world instantaneously. And you have this confluence between communications technologies, Everybody's seeing everything that's going on all at once and all these things that happen. And it gets to the point where that alone, that state of affairs is having a great impact on events and offers tremendous opportunities for this kind of activity. So just to show you the first example, um, how many of you ever heard of the protocols of the elders of Zion? Oh, so, ah, look at that. Some of you have, see? Now, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, to me, that is one of the great pieces of deception and disinformation of the 20th century. The way it came about was my friend Rachkovsky in Paris, from the Okhrana, got this brilliant idea, among many, and he found this document called, um, what was the original name of the document? Let's see. This is so tiny to read it. Yeah, he found his document called the dialogue in hell between Machiavelli and Montesquieu. Now that document in French was political satire, had to do with Napoleonic politics, had nothing to do with anti-Semitism at all, totally irrelevant. So Rachkovsky took, found this document, which was already old by the time he did this, 
He took the document and he edited it somewhat and he transformed it into the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. In fact, if you look at the protocols and you look at this original work, this dialogue, you'll see huge pieces of the text are just like taken word for word. But then he did some creative editing and this was all done in French. And then he took the document, he sent it to Russia, he had it translated into Russian and it was released. In, finally in Russia, in 1902, 1903 timeframe. And so look, some of you have still heard it. You can still get it on the internet today. It's still out there, okay? That's more than 100 years later. Now, what's really interesting about this and show you how effective it really was, and it also illustrates some important principles behind doing this kind of work, is that Henry Ford, remember Henry Ford? Henry Ford had this thing translated and printed up and distributed 500,000 copies of this piece of crap in the United States. And at the beginning of the 20s, when it was exposed by the London Times as being a fraud, you know what Henry Ford's response was? I got bad information, so sue me. That was it. Didn't change a damn thing. The thing is still in circulation today. It didn't make any difference. It was used. The Nazis used it for propaganda and their techniques. I mean, it was used by all sorts of people throughout time, and it's still being used to this very day. So I think that's, that speaks to the genius of Rachkovsky. Now, he didn't have any uh, computers. He didn't have deep fakes. He didn't have anything. But what he had was a lot of imagination. And he, was in it, he, he looked at these things from a point of view of the long game. And this, that's really important, and I want to... I'm going to keep emphasizing that. So the next frontier, of course, in forgeries are digital forgeries, as, we, as you've seen today. And so first I want to talk a little bit about just very quick coverage of some of the new and fun techniques and digital forgeries that are coming down the pipeline. And, um, you know, we've hardly even, I mean, the point is that we've barely even begun to deal with text-based forgeries or text-based disinformation. And now we're getting into this multimedia business. And, you know, things were bad before, and I can guarantee you they're going to get a lot worse real fast. So deep fakes is part of the next generation of uh, forgery technology. So everybody should pay careful attention. Uh, I don't know how many, how many of you have ever tried this uh, website that I'm showing here, uh, thispersondoesnotexist.com. Yeah, it's really great, isn't it? I mean, you can just keep doing a refresh and generating bogus faces all day long. It's really impressive. Nice. Very nice piece of work. But the basic, the really the bottom line of all of this and with the tools that are coming out, tools that are in the pipeline, tools that are about to become available, is total democratization of weapons of mass disruption, as I would call them. Okay. Basically, anybody will be able to build these things for very little cost. So you do it at home, create your own digital forgeries, high quality, really high quality digital forgeries. And you know, like this, I don't know if you heard the second speaker yesterday, but he, that, but he talked about, you know, how he found ways to counter, to detect these forgeries. Well, you know, the reality is it's in an arms race. As fast as somebody figures out a way to detect these things, somebody will find out a better way to make them. So they are not going away. This is, that is not actually going to fix the problem. I mean, it's, you have to do it. It's a great thing to do, but it's not the end of the day. So I want to talk and say a little bit more about what kinds of fun and interesting things you can do with these kinds of forgeries. So here you see a few sort of broad categories, like um, you know, distorting policy debates, eroding trust and in information, damaging national security, disrupting international relations, all kinds of interesting things you can do with these forgeries that you produce. Here are a couple of more specific examples. So like, for example, the first one, fake videos could feature public officials taking bribes, uttering racial epithets, or engaging in adultery. That's a useful thing to be able to do. If you really, uh, if you really have to get somebody, that's a good way to do it. Um, soldiers shown murdering innocent civilians in a war zone, uh, precipitating waves of violence and even strategic harm to the war effort. Or even better, um, a deep fake might falsely depict a white police officer shooting an unarmed black man while shouting racial epithets. That's always a winning concept. So lots and lots of fun things you can do. And I just wanted to show you quickly a couple of examples. Now, you've seen some of these. Some of you may have seen this one specifically. But and I went to Russia and took this you know, beautiful shot of a cathedral. 
Uh, it's great. You know, it's almost good enough to be reasonably priced, easy to download stock footage, which it may in fact be. Uh, but it's got this horrible spotlight blocking the cathedral the whole time, right? So I I'd love to get rid of it. How, how can we do that? Should we even try? Should we? Yeah. Photoshop. And I'll select the spotlight here and the top here and use the incredible content aware fill. And we'll see this result is pretty good. Um, I'd want to touch it up. I could use the stamp tool here because there's a lot of repeat in what that result looks like if you put all those frames back to back. And this is obviously not going to work, right? It's too obvious. There's like some sort of um, force field effect. It looks like the shape of a, of a sphere and look at the result. And you'll see I've removed this spotlight. Makes it easy as fine. That's right there. Thank you. Uh, so in this case, you know, we're removing something that's sort of freestanding in front of a background, but this will also work in cases where it's something's attached, you know, so if you have a stain on your shirt or you've got um, graffiti on the wall you want to remove or maybe your, your drone has a shadow you want to remove. Uh, in this example, I'm removing the strap from the guy's backpack. And this is kind of a subtle result, but I hope you're impressed because it's really hard. We never see behind the strap. So we have to imagine what it looks like behind the strap and then, you know, convincingly propagate that through time even as the guy moves and the lighting changes. Um, yeah, so this is a, this is a hard one to do. Wow. And could you still use that on the people? Can you? Yeah, we can, we can remove the people, yep. See? Where did they go? Being tracked and then they disappear. They got taken by aliens. <laughs> exactly. That's amazing. <laughs> so. So that particular tool that comes from Adobe and uh, the real innovation there was, as you saw, so they, have, they had a way to write simple bounding box. All you got to do is draw a bounding I mean, anybody can do that for, around the object. It's pretty simple and you press a button and it removes it from a still image. The real innovation here was that it would work across multiple frames in a video instead of having to do it frame by frame. So that's, that's really a nice piece of work. Um, but again, it shows how easy it is for somebody to do that. It's really easy. You know, in the old days, when Stalin wanted to remove somebody from a picture and erase them from Soviet history, it was a lot of work, an awful lot of work to do that. Today, just like that. This thing will be available in a store near you soon. Um, here's another fun example. Now listen carefully to what the guy says, the narrator, is really fun. Let's try and darken that up a bit with some cloud. Oh, that's wonderful. What if we were to change all that to, to rock? Okay, let's click on rock, and then we gotta replace the mountain. And let's try waterfall just by pulling water down from the top there. Okay. Wouldn't it be great if everybody could be an artist? If we could take our ideas and turn them into compelling images? This technology allows us to create a smart paintbrush so that if you wanted to create a new picture, you can just draw the shapes of the objects that you want and the neural network can then fill in all the details. If we add a water feature, the network is able to add reflections. Not because we told it that, but because it learned it. Or if we change the ground to be covered in snow, then it knows that the sky also needs to be a different color. I really think this technology is going to be great for architects, designers, people making virtual worlds to train robots and self-driving cars. The input to this model is something we call a segmentation map. It's like a coloring book picture that describes here's where a tree is, here's where the sky is, here's where the ground is, and it doesn't have any details. And then the neural network is able to fill in all the texture and shadows and the colors based on things that it's learned from a large database of real world images. I would like to see that tree reflecting in that pond. 
The real advance here is that we're able to synthesize images with a lot more diversity and more fidelity than we were able to in the past. I really think this technology is going to be great for the dreamers of the world. But what, what he didn't say was that this technology is going to be really great for those who want to create nightmares, not just dreams. <laughs> so he, he kind of glossed over the issue of all the interesting people who are going to be able to take advantage of this kind of technique. But, you know, after all, well, he's selling this thing. What can I say? Uh, but yes, as you can see, that comes from NVIDIA. Nice piece of work that will also be available to you soon. Um, but you can imagine, with very little artistic skill, anybody can cons up. Beautiful pictures of all sorts, showing all kinds of things that don't exist. Right. Let's... Now, as I you know, said before, these kind of deep fakes, this, this kind of technology this is really an arms race. So here was just an example to show that. Um, even the speaker yesterday, because he did this work, um, but I'm throwing it in anyway, I'm repeating it for those of you who didn't hear it. Uh, somebody noticed that in these fake videos, people weren't blinking. The eyes weren't blinking. That doesn't look natural. So... So he and his friends, they all came up with some brilliant algorithm to detect cases where eyes are not blinking. Well, unfortunately, within like a few weeks of the time that he, they posted the paper online describing this really clever technique that they came up with, he started receiving links to pictures of fake videos. And guess what was happening in the pictures? The eyes were blinking. There you go. So all his fine work, well, it wasn't for nothing, but um, wasn't gonna save this, it wasn't going to solve this problem. So... Here's one I want to show you. Now, the, pay careful attention to the final result of this. Look at this video from Saturday Night Live that someone altered and posted on YouTube. I'm, I'm sorry, Lester. It's, it's, this is going so well. On the left, Kate McKinnon is Hillary Clinton. On the right, Clinton's face digitally inserted. They did the same trick with Vladimir Putin. People can now buy software and doctor video at home to create what's called deep fakes. A car Carnegie Mellon University, Professor Alan Black specializes in speech synthesis. He shows us how it works with an audio clock. He has me read some times. The time is now almost 12. And then plugs my voice sample into a synthesizer. He's able to have me say whatever he types. The time is now exactly 10 past 3 in the morning. Okay. I didn't say that. And um, so? <laughs> And that, folks, is the real point, so. It's the so, which is really what it's really all about. It's not the trick itself, the techniques. It's what are you actually going to do with it? And the point is that in, in, in real disinformation, real deception, okay, disinformation is part of a larger idea of deception operations. So any, you know, any kind of large-scale deception operations, whether it's a, a tactical hit-and-run type of event or a large, long-term uh, deception or plan. It requires a lot of thought, a lot of imagination, and a lot of planning. It isn't only about technical tricks. And I want to show you a few examples. Look at this video. That. So here was, this was a really interesting case. So there was an incident that had occurred in India, in the state of Uttar Pradesh in 2013. So in Uttar Pradesh, you have two kind, you have Hindu and Muslim populations living side by side, and there's a lot of tension and discussion between them. So there was an incident where a Hindu girl was being hassled by, hassled by a Muslim boy. She went to complain to her brother. Her brother and cousin went over and paid this boy a visit, and he ended up dead. So that set off some significant amount of violence. Things were looking bad until somebody got the great idea. They did what I call a cognitive vulnerability analysis. A cognitive vulnerability analysis simply means, what is it that my target audience is prepared to believe? And so they did that. They thought it over. And they put up this video. So if you have a weak stomach, you might want to turn away. But this is um, a very gruesome video. Well, I'll, I'll stop it there. But it goes on. This thing goes on. And it shows two guys getting beaten to death by a mob. And it's really, I mean, it gets really, if you thought this was bad, I mean, it gets really ugly later. In the end... It took 45 minutes to kill these two guys, beating them to death in, in front of a mob like that. And then they dragged the bodies to the street. It was, a whole, it was a whole thing. Somebody took that video, put it up on YouTube, and said it was the two Hindu guys who murdered the Muslim boy 
being beaten to death by a Muslim mob in retaliation for that murder. When that video went up, the violence got so bad that the Indian government was forced to bring in 13,000 troops to put down the violence. Okay, so this isn't just some random things, right? I mean, this is, this is pretty heavy stuff. So it turns out that the video is in fact a real video showing two guys getting beaten to death by a mob. That's for real. Just not those two guys. Not only was it not those two guys, but it wasn't even India. What they really was Pakistan and had nothing to do with Hindu-Muslim relations. It was about two guys who got caught as thieves in this village in Pakistan, which is predominantly a Muslim village, and being caught as a thief in a Muslim village, as you can see, is not the healthiest thing to happen to you. So, but it was just, the video required no doctoring, nothing, nothing at all. All it was was the right label. And it, it, it was like pouring gasoline on a fire. Another fun example, again, didn't require, it didn't require any technique at all, actually. Um, so you remember when there was a the big tidal wave and it hit Fukushima, the nuclear power plant in Japan, and everybody was scared this thing was going to melt down and a big radiation cloud was going to come and kill everybody. So the Chinese, so you had a billion, you know, a bill, over a billion Chinese who were scared to death that this was going to happen to them. So in that midst of that panic, I mean, they were sure this radiation cloud was going to come over China and kill everybody. So in the midst of that panic, somebody got a bright idea to start a rumor in Chinese social media space that if you eat a lot of iodized salt, you'll be protected from this coming radiation cloud. Clever idea. And so what they managed to do was to create a run on salt. There were stores in major cities in China where you could not find salt. So, and, I mean, it really got out of hand. I mean, it, people were putting advertisements, all kinds of people were taking fun advantage of it. For example, one guy put an advertisement in the paper, you know, in China there's, um, there's a shortage of women because of the uh, birth, birth policies that they've had. So it's not often easy for men to find wives. This guy put an ad in the paper and he said, I have a dowry. If you come to marry me, I have, you know, I have several sacks of salt. That's, that's my dowry. So he's giving away salt as a dowry as a result of this idea. It was pretty good. I mean, and there were a lot of jokes and fun made about it. But the Chinese government took it very, very seriously because a run on any kind of commodity item like that is a, is a spike in the supply chain. And any kind of supply, spike in the supply chain could lead to potential instabilities. And if there's one thing the Chinese government really, really detests, it's instability of any kind. So they took it very seriously. And the fact that uh, this has been done with other commodity items in China as well. So imagine if you really wanted to get, uh, you know, get underneath the Chinese skin, well, all you had to do is create a whole series of these simultaneously. And boy, you could really generate panic throughout the country. So... So it's interesting, again, but required very little technical skill, just how could you spread a rumor in social media space? Not that difficult, especially when people are already in a state ready to believe it. And that's crucial, by the way. Any good piece of disinformation or deception operation has to be built on real events. It has to sound plausible to your target audience. You can't just pull something out of your behinds and say, okay, well, I'm going to just put this out and I'll have some fun with it. No, most of it will fall flat. If the thought, the thought doesn't go into it, to make it really appealing to your audience, it won't work. So that's really critical. It was another example of that. This was a case that required a little bit of technical skill, but still it was, the, it was really sort of the psychosocial aspect of it that was really important. So this is an event that happened in 2013 where somebody, it turned out later that there's at least a suspicion that it was some Syrian army. Um, but anyway, somebody hijacked the Associated Press Twitter account and put out a tweet saying that, um, but it says there are two explosions in the White House and Barack Obama is injured. So they put out this tweet under the Associated Press Twitter account. The result was that within two minutes or so, the stock market dropped 100 points. It lost $150 billion of value and the market was wiped out. Two minutes. Now, three minutes later, it had come back. But, you know, that's five minutes of complete chaos. And anybody who was under, really understood what they were doing could have made a fortune on that. I mean, if it was me, I'm not certain it wasn't me, but if it was me doing this thing, I would have had all my trades lined up, betting on the market going down. I would have had all my other, the whole other line of trades betting on the market going back up. I would have pressed the button, and when I saw it start to drop like a rock, I'd execute all the first line of trades. And when I saw it start to come back up, I'd execute the second line of trades, and I'd be done. 
and I'd have made a fortune. Now, the interesting part about this is I will recall to you a story of Willie Sutton. How many of you ever heard of Willie Sutton? Uh, one fellow back there, okay, okay, okay. So Willie Sutton was a famous bank robber in the 1930s. He was kind of like a celebrity as well, as well as being a bank robber. He was a celebrity for being a bank robber. And somebody asked him after his question, said, Willie, why do you rob, why do you rob banks? And he said, well, because that's where the money is. <laughs> Not that complicated. The beauty of this kind of business today is I could be sitting in a yurt in outer Mongolia and I could have done this scheme. I don't have to go to the bank. I have to go anywhere. I don't have to be anywhere where anybody could catch me. So that's really the foundation of white-collar crime today. You can do things at a distance. You can even do things like assassinations. But I won't get into that for the moment. Maybe, maybe this time later. I, I'll explain to you how you can assassinate somebody with social media. I don't know. Have anybody you've just ever seen the show Homeland? Okay, well, if you ever saw the show Homeland, it's starting in the fourth season... They introduce a lot of things with social media. And the first episode, they actually they assassinate the chief of the, the head of the CIA in, in uh, Pakistan. So all of that stuff that came that they're using in social media, by the way, came from me. I was, I was consulting on the show. And they used my trick about how to assassinate somebody in the first episode. And I thought that was fun. Um, okay, so the next thing, another simple example. This one is very clever. Now watch this. Okay, so a reporter at large, an editor at large from CNN, put out a tweet that said, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, the Polish prime minister snubbed this, his wife, the Polish prime minister's wife snubbed Donald Trump. Okay, this, is, this scene is in Poland, and he's up on a stage with his wife and with the Polish prime minister and his wife. So that was the message that came out, all right? Now, let's talk about what really happened up there. Okay, so what you see here is that she actually didn't snub him at all. And in fact, what she did was follow pro proper pro Polish protocol. She was supposed to go over and shake Mrs. Trump's hand, and then the president and the Polish prime minister did the same thing. So that's exactly what was supposed to happen. And if you had the sound behind, you could hear the audience shouting, USA, USA, USA. So when you put the sound back in and you showed the rest of the video, it told a completely different story than the first cutoff part. So the only skill required was just to decide where to chop the video off to produce the desired effect. Nothing. Anybody could do that. Very simple. But again, it's the thought. It's the thought that counts. It was another case. Uh, last year, uh, kidnappings were very popular in India as a topic. And somebody showed this video. Now, in India, people really went nuts when they saw this video. I mean, this was, this was somebody claimed they had filmed the kidnapping, a live kidnapping in the street. And this went out, and people were really up in arms and upset. And um, these two poor guys you see in the bottom picture, they stopped somewhere to ask for directions, and they looked like, what, you know, they were on a motorcycle. It seemed like the guys in the picture. And a crowd, uh, you know, formed and uh, tore them apart and kill these guys. And they weren't the only deaths that resulted from all of this business about kidnapping. So it became a big deal. It resulted in a numerous deaths because of people's panic reactions. And the fact is, the video, is comp it, so the, the video wasn't fake in the sense that somebody made it as a fake video for this purpose. The video was actually just a little tiny segment of a Pakistani training film to help raise awareness about child kidnapping. And what this was, was a reenactment that they did as part of the training video as a demonstration to show. So somebody found the training video. They said, okay, great. I'm going to just take that little piece and I'm going to put it up and say it was real. That's all they had to do. The, the Pakistanis did all the work, the guys who made the training video, for exactly the opposite purpose of what this was used for. 
And it worked very nicely. That's a good trick. Again, the thought. It's all about the thought. So I want to define for you just quickly um, what I like to call cognitive security. So at this conference, everybody's hung up on cybersecurity. Cybersecurity in the United States tends to mean technical hacking. I mean, it's about attacking the infrastructure, it's about attacking the box at the end of the infrastructure. And that's all well and good. But um, cognitive security is actually about using those things to attack the people at the, at the end, right? So it's really all about attempts to do mass manipulation of people. And at the end of the day, manipulation of people is based on, it's really emotional manipulation that we're talking about. It's not about reason. You're not convincing somebody by a reasoned argument of, anybody, of anything. Nobody's really listening to that anyway. But uh, things with strong emotional appeal. I mean, I was talking to a guy the other day about, um, we were talking about examples of this and thinking about the American Revolution. So you had the Constitutional Convention. You know, these guys, a lot of clever people sat there, made up this Constitution, did all this work, and kind of hammered all this stuff out. And then, you know, the Revolutionary War ensued. So then the question is, how many people, I mean, average Americans at the time, well, they were British, I guess, but average people at the time had any clue about really, really, really in detail what was in the Constitution. I mean, probably almost nobody really understood it. What, you know what they understood, what the message was? The British are screwing us, let's get them. That was it. You know, you could take all these articles of the Constitution, you could take it, yeah, nobody cared. You know, nobody cared. The Boston Tea Party, that makes an impression. They're screwing us, they're taxing us. They're doing this, it's all unfair, we hate them, let's get them. That's what really drove people, not the Constitution. So the thing that's, you know, that's different today is that the techniques for doing, running deception operations and di using disinformation, there, you can do things on a scale that you couldn't dream of before. All right? I mean, you could make things happen instantly or over a large period of time. So you could do all sorts of things which simply wasn't possible to do. And not only that, but the operations themselves are easy to conceal. So it's really easy to hide in the mass of things that are happening on a normal basis. So really, the internet and social media in general provide us with a whole different kind of a background to pull off all kinds of fantastic deception operations and scams of various sorts. So that's really, that's really, I would say, different. Plus the fact that the news, media, the news itself is no longer the gatekeeper of truth and information. Pe people are getting most of their information off the, off from some social media site or other off, off the internet. Where there's really very little control, there's no redaction. I mean, it's just you, whatever people want. So, you know, the journalists have sort of fallen by the wayside here. Another big fe feature that's new is really the whole idea of participatory propaganda. So in this case, disinformation campaigns, the people who are, you know, the people who are the targets are themselves th the perpetrators in this kind of a scheme because it's a little bit like the telephone game. You've seen everybody sit around in a circle, right? One guy whispers something, and at the end it comes out completely different, right? But imagine that happening on a massive scale, as it does today. So the fact, so the way people communicate with each other, the way things get distorted, you are in fact supporting the effort in various ways when you do that. And so, you know, planners, deception planners today are taking advantage of that kind of thing. So um, it's really, really, uh, it's a very useful trick. So it's, it's not technical. Here you're making a guess about people's behavior and you're estimating people's behavior and how they react to things. So, so a lot of this kind of work, I mean, really disinformation and deception operations in general, is really about behavioral analysis. I mean, that's really what you're looking at. And in a behavioral manipulation, emotional manipulation, that's really the secret. Um, so what I want to do is also just say a word about artificial intelligence. I've worked in the artificial intelligence business for 35 years. I mean, I worked at the very first commercial AI company ever in 1983. And I can tell you that the last big wave of AI, which was in the 80s, I mean, I, I have lived through in my lifetime two AI winters where AI really became unpopular. The first one was in the beginning of the 70s, and the second one was sort of the beginning of the 90s, just somewhere during the 90s. And I was two times a, an AI program manager at DARPA, so I've seen a lot of this stuff uh, develop as it came. And I could tell you that I could take articles that were written in magazines and publications. It, was, it looked, in 1983, it looked just like it does today. You can't open an, a newspaper, you couldn't turn on a deal without anybody, AI this, AI that, AI is gonna save the world, right? Everything. So and today you hear about the Chinese are gonna take over the world with AI. 
Well, you know what you heard in 1983 in the 80s? The Japanese are going to take over the world with AI. How many of you have ever heard or remember the Japanese fifth generation project? Yeah, exactly my point. <laughs> Most of you have never heard of it. I know a lot of younger people who are working in the field today, never heard of it. And in the 80s, it was a huge, huge deal. And the Japanese made spectacular claims how they were going to rule everything with this technology. And then when the whole thing fell flat, the Ministry of Industry and uh, Transportation, well, in Industry and Technology, MIDI, who was bankrolling this thing, they put an enormous amount of money, enormous amount of prestige. At the end, they just shut it down, and that was the end of it. They, you know, they, they declared it a success and moved on. So um, I can see that happening again soon in a different way. It'll look different than it did last time. But in any case, um, to show, just to bring back to, you know, to why I started on this with the AI, everybody's talking about statistical machine learning. Okay? Well, I got news for you. AI is a much bigger field than statistical machine learning. There's a hell of a lot more to it than that. And one of the most interesting aspects of AI technology that's been developed over the last 40, 50 years is auto automatic planning systems, AI planning systems. It is a huge area. You can look it up. I mean, the literature is enormous. <clears throat> now, why do I say it's relevant here? Because when it comes to actually planning deception operations and disinformation operations, planning, this kind of planning is key. You have to plan how, you know, how you're gonna, what is it that you're going to distribute, for what effect, and how you're going to distribute it and make sure that the effect is actually happening. It's, all, it's very complicated and there's a lot to it if you're going to really do this right and really have an impact. So I think it's a good place to bring back AI planning technology to help actually plan large-scale deception operations, disinformation operations, and so on. So I'm, I know that's coming. Uh, it hasn't yet. In fact, I can tell you that the, the original title, okay, the original title of my PhD thesis from a very long time ago was going to be the automatic generation of plausible disinformation. So it was an AI thesis. Um, I was a little bit ahead of my time, but... I mean, I can talk to you all about it. I, I worked out a whole topic of disinformation theory as opposed to information theory. What does that mean? What is, how do you define that? Uh, there's a whole, lots of very interesting problems with it when you really get into it. Um, so anyway, plans, I think it's worth it. I get, there's a couple of references here if anybody's interested. You could, there are actually entire courses, from, I mean, from AI courses about AI planning. If anybody wants to look them up and take a look, I would, I would recommend it. So I think I'm going to stop there. Um, you know, it's just, you've heard of mass manufacturing, you know, mass, customized, mass cust customization of mass manufacturing. Well, we're now in, the, in, in, the, in this age of you know, customiz customizing mass uh, messaging. Because mass customization, you can customize on a massive scale today in a way you couldn't do before. And really define target audiences, and that gets really into a lot more techniques about how you actually do this kind of work. But uh, I think I'll just stop there in case there are any questions. Yes. Yes. Well, it, it, it really refers to, I mean, it's the idea, how do you protect people from mass manipulation through new media? So it's like, it's like cybersecurity is about, you know, of defending and attacking technical systems. Cyber secu cognitive security is about defending and attacking cognitive your human beings. I understand that Well, there are certainly practices. By the way, they ripped that term off from me. I gave them the term. <laughs> but that's okay. I don't mind. Well, so I just showed you a whole bunch of examples of what you can do from the offensive side, right? I mean, all the examples I showed you, those, that, those are really, uh, those are attacks. They're all attacks. They're all, they're all attempts at manipulation through this type of techniques. So that's, that's, that's from the offensive side. From the defensive side, 
nobody's done anything. So the basic, the bottom line is that the United States government has chosen to leave the population completely undefended. That's where we are now. Yes. I'm sorry? Do they need? No, nah, not, not, not like this. It used to. It used to. It's really interesting. I mean, up until the beginning of the 70s, we had capability to do this in a serious way. But it was all disbanded. It, 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 was, an ins it was insanity. Because what happened was, Detente was introduced at the beginning of the 70s. The United States government, in its infinite wisdom, decided, well, now we have detente, we don't need this kind of techniques anymore. So they, so they shut most of it down, what they had. And then there were other issues that came up. So you had, um, there were the Frank Church hearings, and you had the whole introduction of FISA courts, and you had all sorts of things that made it very difficult to, or next to impossible to do this kind of work. But it, it all shut down. And then in 1981, interestingly enough, when Reagan came into office, he said, well, you know, maybe that wasn't such a smart idea to shut all that down. And he made at least some feeble effort to revive this, and he created something called the Active Measures Working Group. So the Active Measures Working Group, which I highly recommend to you to go out and, um, you know, to, find, to read the history, there's some really nice work done on it. The purpose of the group was to try to counter Soviet active measures. And the group was formed in 81, and it was disbanded in 1991. When the Soviet Union dissolved, they disbanded the whole thing. And I was talking to a very senior official from the State Department, together with a friend of mine who was one of the last members of this committee. And I said, well, you know, why did you guys decide to disband the committee in 1991 and all the work that it was doing? And she said, well, the Cold War was over. It wasn't necessary anymore. I said, wow. Okay. Is, it, is that a view that's widely held by people in the State Department at senior level? She said, yes. I said, well, you know, that explains a lot. I mean, because anybody who believed any of that stuff was over in 1991 just because the Soviet Union dissolved, I mean, I, this is like naive in the extreme. I mean, if you look at the Russians today, just to take an example, as I say, the active measures, this, even the Soviets got it from the Okhrana, from the Tsarist secret police. The modern Russians, the Russians have got, took the whole, the playbook from the KGB. So, I mean, this is a long tradition and I, there's no reason... <laughs> And it's even today, it's even some of the same guys from the KGB days who are doing it. So, you know, these things have long continuous histories. The Chinese, the Chinese have been doing this kind of work for a very, very, I mean, we're talking thousands of years, right? And they're masters at it, and they do fantastic work. I mean, I can give a, I can stand here and talk to you for two hours about the kinds of things the Chinese do. But, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's been, but from the U.S. government's perspective, no. And if you really want to see where we are in the U.S., listen to the hearings when Mark Zuckerberg was called before the Senate Armed Services Committee and listened to the questions that the members, that the members were asking him. So Orrin Hatch, all right, I don't know how many of you have heard of Orrin Hatch, a senator from, uh, from Utah. He said, and I quote, Mr. Zuckerberg, I don't understand. If you're not charging people for your service, how is it that you make any money? Well, you know, when I hear that, the only thing I can see is Vladimir Putin rolling on the floor in his office in hysterics, clutching his side from pain, from laughter. And he's thinking to himself, <clears throat> you know, I could shut down the GRU and I could shut down the FSB. This is the Russian intelligence. What do I need those jokers for? Because I've got Orrin Hatch and all of his moron friends sitting in the United States Congress and they're doing all the work just for me. I don't need to know them. I don't need to pay them. I don't need to talk to them. I don't have to have anything to do with them. And they're doing the whole job. It's fantastic. I mean, how can you beat it? You can't. So that's, so those, and in fact, I can tell you that one of the permanent staffers sent me an email before the hearing and asked me to send some questions that the members could ask. So I, two pages of questions I sent him. So he writes back to me and he says, you know, these are great questions. They're not going to use any of that stuff. And instead, you heard the idiocies that you uh, heard, if you listened. Instead of real questions, which would have been something substantial, no. It's completely stupid. So that pretty much sums up where we are as the United States government. So, any other question? Yes. So, so how, does this play out? how does it play out? Badly. <laughs> very, very badly. That's how it plays out. I don't see any sign, any sign <clears throat> of this improving here. 
I mean, I, I'll give you an example. I gave a talk, the, um, there's, there's something called AFSEA and INSA. These are intelligence community professional societies. And I gave a talk at one of their big meetings. I, I gave a talk and I said, and, and it, it, it was a source on open source intelligence. And that was an open meeting. And I came and it came to me and I said, I said, well, you know, I said, the Russians, the Chinese, Hezbollah, ISIS, the mafia, Google, Yahoo, basically every asshole on the face of this planet has complete free and open access to our public, public social media data. I'm not talking about breaking into anything. I'm just talking about listening to what you can that's available. Everybody except the United States government. Now, what is wrong with that picture, folks? There's something terribly wrong. If, you're either, if you live under Title 10 or Title 50 of the U.S. Code, which means you're either in the intelligence business or the defense business, you are not allowed to be monitoring public social media data. Well, I, heard it, I don't know about you, but I actually find that somewhat problematic if you're actually thinking in terms of defending the population. And that's only the beginning. I mean, there are all sorts of reasons why this stuff is not being done and what the problems are. But, um, you know, I could give a long talk about that. But anyway, where we, it's, it's, it's heading towards a very, very bad end at this point with no relief in sight whatsoever. Our adversaries, they're sharpening their pencils and they're working and improving technique constantly while we do nothing. That's where it is. So, on that pleasant note, I'll stop. <laughs> Thank you.